All right, so in the last lecture, the first one on, on electromagnetics, I had talked about um, frequency of electromagnetic radiation, uh, electromagnetic waves, and their, uh, the, the effect of frequency on the skin depth, uh, which uh, together uh, um, the, uh, the frequency and the, uh, the resistivity of the earth material uh, tell you about the skin depth, which is how far uh, essentially an electromagnetic wave will, will uh, 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 can be seen inside that, uh, that material uh, below the surface. Um, and we had talked about uh, two different uh, electromagnetic survey uh, methods. Uh, one is frequency domain based and the other one is time domain based. And uh, I've been showing you some instruments. Uh, uh, for instance, a, a couple of uh, frequency domain uh, instruments, the, uh, the LNR Mini EM. Um, the uh, the Geonix uh, EM34 with its uh, separable coils, and then the um, Geonix EM31 with its uh, coils uh, held at a constant distance of uh, about uh, uh, almost four meters apart by this uh, pole that you carry horizontally. Uh, now here's a uh, an example of a uh, time domain EM instrument, the Zong. Nanotem, um, and then there's also, of course, uh, the competitor uh, Geonix has a uh, time domain EM instrument, uh, the uh, the Geonix ProTem uh, line, and um, uh, so those are uh, uh, time domain uh, data collection devices. Um, now, I'd like to continue with uh, uh, a look at uh, some additional. Uh, uh, Electromagnetic uh, uh, survey instruments, uh, particularly with the uh, what we had looked at already, our, our ground-based instrumentation and uh, electromagnetic, since it doesn't require ground contact, right? Um, it's uh, uh, very easy to uh, make electromagnetic surveys from the air. Okay, so this is the uh, the DigHem um, uh, horizontal uh, uh, coil uh, EM. Which is carried by a helicopter uh, um, uh, within a uh, a bird uh, that's uh, then carried by a helicopter, um, and uh, you know so it's kind of like a uh, a large and uh, uh, a large EM thirty one that you can use uh, for very rapid uh, survey mapping work uh, for uh, conductivity and resistivity. Um, of course, you don't want to have to refly uh, your, uh, uh, you know, any any places you you get flown. So um, within the Digem is a um, uh, are all the different coils at once, and they're all making measurements at the same time. Okay, so you have um, uh, different sets of uh, transmitter coils. There's uh, uh, vertical coils, um, which I believe are um, are uh, perpendicular to the uh, flight line. Uh, those vertical coils are um, uh, operating at both uh, audio frequencies of uh, both low and high. Okay, 900 hertz versus uh, 7200 hertz. Okay, both uh, audio. And then there's as well a set of horizontal coils, which are uh, you know the coil plane is parallel to the ground. And uh, those are operating at 7,200 hertz, 900 hertz, and also um, uh, 56 kilohertz. Okay, so there's a you know constantly recorded set of uh, both uh, transmitter and receiver coils in in the same orientation. Okay, so uh, uh, and also the uh, the bird uh, uh, often contains a. Uh, uh, a magnetometer. Okay, so uh, uh, you know, really taking advantage of as much data as you can collect uh, at the same time. All right. Um, of course, you've got to have uh, real-time differential GPS navigation. Uh, you've got to have uh, all kinds of uh, instrumentation to figure out. You know, for each measurement, exactly where is the uh, uh, the Digham bird and uh, and how far it is above the ground. Uh, this uh, uh, bird was for, was flown uh, in the last uh, 
Millennium uh, uh, under a helicopter by uh, Wash the Washoe County Water Resources Department, and it was flown uh, essentially uh, uh, all over the Carson Range. And in particular, here's a uh, a plot uh, from uh, from Gary Opliger. Uh, this these data were used in um, a, uh, a PhD thesis uh, on the Mount Rose Fan and its water resources. So you can see uh, the intersection of um, US 395 and the Mount Rose Highway. This is all before the uh, <clears throat> the freeway was built uh, along uh, uh, sort of uh, this uh, this alignment here. Although maybe that's it uh, right there. That could be the freeway there. And um, uh, you can see that uh, there are uh, these uh, uh, lower uh, 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 resistivity areas uh, that uh, correspond to the areas where there's the uh, the thickest sediments and the and the greatest uh, potential for producing uh, producing water. Um, the county had this flown for uh, reasons of of uh, better defining uh, the groundwater resources where the county is the water uh, service provider. <coughs> you know, Tumwa um, provides water from the Truckee River. Um, and from its uh, both underground and, and above ground reservoirs, uh, uh, mainly uh, for the city of Sparks, the city of uh, um, the city of, uh, of Reno, and and other areas that are near the Truckee River, but the um, uh, the county itself is uh, the municipal water provider in areas that are not close enough to the, to the Truckee River uh, to uh, draw on that uh, that resource. Um, there's uh, you know there's uh, more uh, uh, digem uh, instruments uh, you know here's uh, one with uh, uh, coils that uh, go as uh, and 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 uh, this has a separate a full coil separation of almost eight meters okay um, so uh, and and the uh, coils go down to as uh, as low frequency as uh, uh, as 400 Hertz and there are five different uh, uh, five different frequencies used. So uh, you know this is a the kind of um, you know, and of course each frequency has a different skin depth, right? And uh, the lower the frequency, the uh, the deeper the skin depth. So in terms of audio electromagnetic uh, <coughs> data collection, uh, this is one of the uh, 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 you know one of the most capable instruments uh, that we have in. Uh, in frequency domain. Uh, so here's the uh, uh, the six frequency system being uh, being carried on a uh, uh, on a truck uh, for lifting uh, by a helicopter. You know that's uh, almost uh, eight meters there, um, and then that can be uh, that can be flown uh, you know very efficiently. Um, so here's uh, uh, here's the uh, the resolve system uh, in the uh, in the air. Uh, it's got a, a laser altimeter built into it as well. Uh, as the uh, what is it? There's two times uh, six coils, right? Uh, there's just one vertical coil used, uh, just for kind of a, a cross check. Mostly uh, horizontal coils. For the greatest depth penetration, um, and that's uh, um, uh, that's uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the ways it's done. Now here's a, a time domain EM system, okay, and the way that's usually uh, arranged is uh, you have a um, um, a receiver coil in the middle of a uh, of a transmitter coil. And the larger the area you have uh, inside your transmitter coil, the uh, the bigger the magnetic moment. I mean, of course, the magnetic moment also depends on the the total current and the number of turns of wire that you're able to uh, pump through there. And you know, since um, uh, you know the more current you have to pump through the wire, the the thicker the wire has to be, and uh, you know you're limited in the number of uh, of turns, at least that you can uh, you can carry efficiently. Um, so here we see a, a coil that's been arranged between the wingtips and booms 
on a uh, on a fixed wing aircraft. Okay, and uh, this uh, this kind of configuration is used with a uh, a bird that's carried uh, that's carrying the uh, receiver coils. Okay, and uh, uh, and that uh, that bird could be uh, uh, you know it could be kept close to the uh, the belly of the aircraft, which means you would have uh, uh, basically uh, the same center for the receiver coils as for the uh, uh, as for the transmitter coil. Or it could be uh, flown out um, and lowered down and, and uh, uh, extended so that the uh, the bird was uh, you know some distance away laterally from the uh, the transmitter coil. Okay, um, <clears throat> and of course you can see the coil gets uh, uh, distorted. Uh, its shape is is not circular, of course, and its shape gets distorted by by the uh, airflow. Uh, you know at, at flight speed. Um, this is a system that's uh, that's used by uh, Fugro, uh, which is a uh, geophysical services company. Um, this is uh, called the uh, Tempest TEM Time Domain uh, Electromagnetics. Okay, so a uh, fixed wing uh, that's that's the fixed wing aircraft system. Okay, so uh, the uh, the the coil is uh, uh, well. Here's maybe a, a, an easier way to look at it with this helicopter system. Okay, the transmitter coil is hung down uh, around the outside. The receiver coils, you know, only a, uh, a meter wide, are are in the center of it, and you can see that this is uh, quite uh, nicely uh, centered here. Uh, and that whole thing is uh, you know towed below a helicopter, and uh, you don't need ground contact. So from wherever you are. Uh, you know, and, and you get better results, of course, if you uh, put the whole thing as close to the ground as possible, right? Um, so uh, you just fly that along, and and as you're flying along, you know, maybe at ninety miles an hour, um, the um, you know every uh, tenth of a second or so, the uh, the TEM is uh, is flipping sign, and um, uh, in the in the transmitter, and the receiver coil is picking up that. Uh, uh, that voltage, which uh, from the eddy currents, we, you know, which are dropping into the ground, uh, that uh, over the next uh, maybe up to a second. Okay, so um, and, and these are these systems are, are uh, uh, rated by their uh, um, their dipole moments, which are expressed in terms of amps times meters uh, squared. Okay, so uh, it's amps. Uh, um, Times uh, the area uh, within the trans the transmitter, uh, the transmitter coil, and um, uh, and so you you multiply the amps times the meter squared, and you get uh, 230,000 for this uh, heli geotem system. Uh, here's a uh, uh, the system uh, on the ground being deployed and and picked up by the helicopter. All right, and then uh, here's a, a yeah, system on an even larger, uh, 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 on an even larger fixed wing aircraft. Okay, um, so you can see that there's a this huge heavy cable that's held between the wingtips and the and the booms on the front and, and rear of the aircraft. It's providing a large area, and also there's uh, enough uh, enough uh, you know thickness of the of the cables here that they can support huge currents. Okay. So uh, and then you have a receiver bird as well, which can be uh, either uh, you know centered within the the transmitter or extended uh, down and and some distance behind the transmitter cable, the transmitter coil. Okay, and and you know the frequencies that are used here on these airborne systems are you know ten to thirty hertz basically. Uh, and here is, uh, you know, they call it, Fugger calls it the Megatem. This is a really large, you know, four-engine uh, fixed-wing aircraft, uh, basically a, a, a passenger plane. Um, so you can imagine, you know, cruising here at uh, four or five hundred miles an hour, um, you can cover a lot of territory. And with this uh, kind of very large uh, uh, area within the transmitter coil, you know, you've got the, a huge dipole moment that. Uh, uh, that you can take advantage of too. So this is a uh, time domain EM system, and uh, 
the receiver coils, I'm sure, are in the belly of the of the plane here. And um, you know, if you're going to map an entire country, uh, this would be about the only practical way to do it. Okay, um, and uh, you know, we're getting every you know every thirtieth uh, uh, of a second, uh, perhaps. Uh, you know, you're getting a um, um, a you're able to invert a conductivity profile out of the the uh, time domain uh, electromagnetic uh, data that you get from a system like this. So, uh, you know, you fly flight lines uh, back and forth. Um, you can cover a lot of area. Um, it can be a fairly hostile territory where you can never get vehicles. Um, you know, over fresh water, it should work as well. So, uh, uh, you know, this is really a, uh, uh, you know, of course, the, the equipment, the plane, uh, the airtime is all very expensive. But uh, uh, in terms of uh, the kind of work you can, you can do, um, this is going to be, uh, this sort of system is going to be very efficient. Um, here's a, an illustration of the kind of uh, data that you get with a, uh, a megatem or geotem. Okay, you've got uh, the the plane is actually towing two different birds. Okay, it's towing a uh, uh, a magnetics bird, and uh, also you know you you want to you want to if as long as you're going to fly this right, you're going to you're going to measure uh, you you want to have a magnetometer out there anyway. So 50 meters below the flight line and maybe um, 130 meters behind is the uh, is the uh, receiver coils in in the EM bird, and of course the transmitter is uh, around the plane itself. Uh, so the transmitter is generating the primary field in green, which is then uh, uh, cutting through the conductors and every uh, uh, you know here's the transmitter current in in red there. And uh, that's setting up the green uh, uh, transmitter field in this, uh, you know, aerial section here. Um, so you get a, uh, a primary uh, magnetic field at the at the receiver coil. Uh, you know, it might be sign reversed because you're somewhere out. You know, you're not concentric with the uh, with the transmitter. <coughs> and then you uh, you cut that off, right? The the, the transmitter current is is uh, is cut off. And so um, we get uh, uh, um, uh, oh, there's a there's a magnetic signal, okay, which the magnetic bird can also uh, measure, and there's a um, um, a receiver coil uh, uh, secondary, uh, uh, you know, from the cutoffs you get a uh, a secondary uh, field at the receiver coil. Okay, and that comes from the the secondary magnetic field, which is uh, dashed in gray down here. You know, comes from the eddy currents that are set up in the conductors. Uh, also, for illustration here are the uh, the magnetic fields. That's B. Okay, uh, V is voltage, right? So these are the voltage fields at the receiver coil, both primary and secondary. <clears throat> and uh, uh, here's the uh, the magnetic field. You know, which exactly at the receiver Coil, it uh, exactly correlates with the the transmitter uh, for the uh, except you know before and after you know during and well at each you know the launching of the of the transmitter current and the uh, and then the cutoff of the of the transmitter current you know results in the eddy currents and uh, then here's the uh, the die off this exponential die off which is. Uh, the main source of the uh, sounding data for uh, the time domain EM. Um, you know, here's uh, all of the uh, the specs, and uh, the really important one uh, that tells you you know how deep you're going to be able to survey, um, and through uh, you know what kind of materials is this dipole moment. You know that dipole moment is what's going to allow you to overcome the uh, the skin depth and and see those. Uh, you know, the larger the transmitter's uh, magnetic dipole moment, the the larger the primary magnetic field, the the larger the eddy currents that it will induce in the uh, in in conductive bodies, <coughs> at uh, at at you know even at, at great depth, um, and uh, um, the uh, uh, then the uh, the larger the signal at the receiver. Okay, so uh, you know you want um, <clears throat> um, 
uh, you want a larger and larger moment, and that's what this megatem has has achieved. You know, the geotem itself, at least at low frequencies, is able to attain almost a uh, a million uh, amps times uh, meters squared, whereas the uh, the megatem in some configurations can go up to uh, two point two million. So that that means uh, you know maybe even uh, forty percent deeper you can get uh, information that's just as good. Um, it's just an il illustration of what you have uh, in uh, uh, what you'll see in that that exponential drop off. If the ground is insulating, you know it'll drop off. It'll, it'll start at a higher level. It'll the this these are the eddy uh, eddy currents. They'll start off at a high level and they'll drop off pretty fast. Okay, uh, you know this is uh, maybe a sixtieth of a second, right? This whole time for drop off is a is a sixtieth of a second. In a in a more conductive, you know, lower resistivity material, or, or over that, then the uh, the wave starts at a at a lower level, not the wave, but the uh, the drop off starts at a lower level and takes a lot longer to to drop off. Okay, and so you know you sample that drop off and then you can model it and you can make a uh, a vertical resistivity structure, you know, with layers uh, that have certain resistivities, and and then you can essentially model that. Uh, that drop off. These are some uh, illustrations of results. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, saline water. Uh, you know, purple and red is 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 highly uh, conductive. Uh, uh, you know, millisiemens per meter um, over uh, 150. The blue is uh, is highly is more highly resistive. You know, lower conductivity, down around uh, two um, uh, millisiemens per meter. Okay. <clears throat> um, so it's uh, uh, you know we have a, a buried paleo channel that's not evident at the surface and it's got saline water in it. All right, and then here's an example of of overburden mapping for uh, uh, pipeline construction and where we have uh, you know low uh, at the top of the of this scale here is uh, low millisiemens per meter. Right, we got high you know thirty millisiemens per meter at the at the bottom. Okay. So uh, you know you can fly a uh, a dig hem over this and um, and make a three D model of uh, of where the uh, where the conductivities are. Okay, and uh, uh, so where you have uh, lower uh, uh, conductivity, you know that would be uh, bedrock uh, rather than overburden. Okay, let's uh, focus in. On uh, here, where we have uh, very uh, uh, some very conductive stuff, okay, and um, uh, you know there were some holes drilled here, uh, which found the depth of, of overburden. All right, and here's a, a very conductive area that uh, uh, maybe is is actually showing a, a mineral resource uh, rather than just uh, uh, basin depth, you know, or, or soil depth, okay. And here's a uh, uh, you know a transect along the uh, <clears throat> the center of the pipeline route, which is showing according to the uh, the electromagnetics the depth of bedrock and um, and then uh, the uh, uh, you know that's the uh, the top of the black uh, curves here, the black columns, and then the projected depth that they'd like to bury the pipe, and so. You know, you can make your excavation plans uh, much more accurately. Um, you know, especially along this, you know, long pipeline uh, transect, you can make those plans much more accurately once you've uh, got a survey like this. Uh, here's some uh, mapping of water bearing fractures. You know, you look at uh, magnetic field, and you can see some of the uh, some of the the bedrock geology. Okay, but you map with. Um, <clears throat> And and that's you can see all that's got pretty much a northeast strike, okay, but you map with the um, uh, the apparent conductivity. And this is at uh, uh, four point four uh, kilohertz, okay. So it's relatively shallow apparent conductivity, but uh, uh, nonetheless there is uh, a certain amount, you know, certain number of meters of depth penetration here. And you can start lining up these uh, high conductivity anomalies in uh, red and purple. Uh, and they appear to have a uh, predominant strike as well, um, you know, more to the north northeast. And so those those are the fractures that are cross cutting the uh, 
the bedrock stratigraphy here. And uh, those uh, those fractures are uh, are, are water bearing, and and that's why they're showing up as uh, conductivity anomalies. Here's a uh, pollution control uh, um, <clears throat> example. So uh, we have a a land landfill, a sanitary landfill in Norman, Oklahoma. It does rain there, so uh, you know rain falls in the landfill and doesn't all get uh, um, you know sloughed off. Uh, by the uh, cap, you know, and the landfill might uh, not only leach but also just leak uh, uh, contaminated fluids. All right, and so um, where we have dark results here, uh, we have uh, uh, higher uh, conductivity. So we have uh, you know some contaminated, more conductive fluid <clears throat> um, that's uh, uh, that's leaching out of the uh, into the groundwater. And this uh, survey was done with an EM34, and and you know here the conductivities are plotted against all of, all of these central points of the uh, uh, central points of the uh, of the EM34 deploy deployments, and so this is uh, uh, you know looking at uh, what uh, according to EM34 uh, data inversion is uh, the apparent. The apparent conductivity at a depth of twenty meters, and uh, there's an old channel out here. You can see that uh, within that old channel, it's more conductive, and it's and you can connect that back to the uh, contaminated water in the landfill, just right here in the in the high conductivity results uh, that are that are darker, and you can see well then uh, we must have uh, 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 contamination leaking from the landfill and into this old channel. Okay, and uh, hopefully not, but possibly you know eventually into the uh, into the river. Uh, now this is the uh, conductivity view that's uh, from the EM thirty one. So instead of being twenty meters depth, again it's a, a frequency domain electromagnetic measurement, and we're we're measuring conductivity on the same scale. You'll notice that you know compared to the last one, the EM thirty one results are lighter in uh, their density. Uh, the gray is is lighter, which means that it's uh, less conductive overall. Okay, and that's uh, that's good news. Uh, you know, less contamination, less conductive, but you can still see the channel out outlined, and you can still see the uh, the leachate coming out of the landfill, especially on this uh, uh, on this, uh, um, this kind of southwest corner here or southern tip of the of the landfill. And even at these, uh, even at these, uh, the EM thirty one is sensitive down to just uh, two or three meters depth. Okay, and even at these shallow depths, we still see that that evidence of <clears throat> contamination in the old channel, uh, of contamination of the groundwater. Now here, here also, you know, just to kind of match it, is the EM thirty four results at this sort of intermediate depth of ten meters. Okay, and it's this, it's the same story. So. You know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of support here for uh, that leaching into the old uh, old channel and and pollution uh, invasion uh, going into that old channel. Um, you know, if you'd only seen that same effect uh, with, you know, at only one depth range or or with one instrument, um, but you know, if it's reproducible over uh, uh, over uh, uh, different instruments and different depth ranges. Uh, where an instrument allows different depth ranges, like the M34 does, because you could change the separation. Well, then, um, you know, you have some uh, 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 some indication that it's probably uh, more of a supportable conclusion. Okay. Uh, now here's the the results uh, again for um, the uh, airborne EM resistivity of the helicopter flown uh, DIGEM. Um, and uh, we're seeing the, uh, uh, you know, both uh, fresh water and also geothermal waters, which are giving uh, um, higher. Let's see. Um, there's several contours here. Uh, these are uh, apparent um, uh, resistivities. So let's see. That's two. That's one. Okay. So we have. Uh, I believe low resistivities in the purple areas. <clears throat> that could be uh, uh, that could be uh, you know these skin depths here 
are uh, you know 53 and 167 meters. Uh, the largest contour is has a skin depth of uh, 4 and 18 meters. Okay, uh, at the higher uh, higher ohm meters, so uh, you know the skin depth is smaller in the more conductive areas in the lower resistivity areas, but the um, <clears throat> Um, uh, but the skin depth is still at least 50 meters. So we're probably looking at geothermal fluids, which are, uh, you know, there's uh, about 100, uh, uh, about 100 uh, megawatts of geothermal production right in this in this area, and that's, uh, uh, you know, essentially what we're uh, the system that we're looking at here. Um, now for Washoe County, you know, the uh, the higher resistivities are are better because they want to produce water, not geothermal water, for uh, for domestic use. So we have to go to these higher resistivity areas here, where the water is fresher and not geothermally related. So here above two ohm meters apparent uh, resistivity, uh, that's where Washoe County then, uh, you know, far enough west, further far enough up the fan, they can see uh, the boundary, you know, right along here. Between um, the fresh water on the left and uh, on the west, and the the more geothermal waters on the on the east. Okay. Notice, of course, that the uh, uh, you know some of the lowest conductivities are are right here. This is the uh, uh, Summit Sierra Mall, and uh, the Apple Store is like right there. So uh, that's kind of an interesting uh, <laughs> interesting observation there. That uh, uh, you know we've got. Uh, uh, we've got a geothermal area under that uh, mall, and in fact, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, up here is the uh, um, the Redfield campus of UNR, which is also a uh, a geothermal area, and also has fairly low conductivity. All right, now I'm gonna I'm gonna talk just very brief briefly about the magnetotellurics method. Uh, just enough so that uh, maybe some of the jargon and uh, uh, things that are that are talked about in uh, papers on uh, you know more academic papers on magnetotellurics uh, uh, will be at least a little less opaque for you. Uh, so um, magnetotellurics uh, relies a lot on the skin depth uh, um, uh, argument, and um, you know how do you get to uh, you know how do you get some some depth penetration like all the way through the crust? Well, you got to have really long wavelengths. Okay, so um, magnetotellurics is a way of looking at really long wavelength uh, electromagnetics. Okay, um, so you know long wavelength means uh, means low frequency, and uh, here's uh, an illustration of uh, skin depth in. Uh, um, in, in meters to uh, uh, you know a, a, a half space of 100 uh, ohm meters, okay. And uh, as you uh, as the frequency goes down, the skin depth goes up. So the frequency starts here at uh, at 0.2 meters at 10 hertz, and uh, and goes down to uh, 1.6 meters at uh, 0.1 hertz, right? So that's not that's not very far, you know. For crust, we, we need thirty kilometers of uh, of skin depth, really, for crustal and, and upper mantle work. And so, we're going to be working with frequencies that are, uh, you know, far far uh, lower than that. So, uh, you know, we're dealing with frequencies uh, that are so low they're, you know, really on the they really have uh, periods in time of about, uh, you know, twelve hours, which is similar to the uh, diurnal variation that. Is caused in the magnetic field by uh, the uh, uh, the ionosphere, and that same ionospheric uh, uh, change is going to produce what are called telluric currents, uh, which are propagating uh, usually horizontally through the ground. Okay, and uh, you know they're they're they tend to be stronger uh, uh, close to the uh, surface, uh, you know, according to the skin depth than than at depth. Um, but you know, if they're propagating through a uh, ground that, uh, you know, say through a crustal section that does that has all about the same uh, um, the same uh, resistivity, then they're pretty much going to propagate horizontally. Now here, those telluric currents are propagating through a uh, uh, a salt dome, and that the resistivity of that salt dome, uh, you know, where the salt is massive and not fractured and full of water, right? 
uh, and salt heals pretty fast. So uh, um, you know, certainly over geologic time. So in general, the salt uh, here is an insulator, uh, and that's going to deflect those telluric currents. And it's it's those deflections is is what the uh, the magnetotelluric uh, uh, method looks for. Okay, so we got the ionosphere, uh, which is uh, changing as different parts of it are illuminated during the day. Uh, those changes are causing uh, currents in the uh, ionosphere, <clears throat> and um, you know the impacts of the sun. You know what else produces big currents in the atmosphere uh, that will produce telluric currents in the Earth? Uh, thunderstorms. Okay, so here's a thundercloud and lightning. And that uh, radio frequency is going to bounce around uh, between the ionosphere and the and the surface of the Earth, um, and that's going to produce uh, more currents. Okay, so at high frequencies, you know, we see uh, in the magnetic spectrum. Okay, so this is you know this is the this would be the spectrum of say our uh, magnetic base station uh, instrument. Okay, uh, you know if we took the re that magnetic base station recording and put it through a uh, um, you know, versus time, you know, magnetic intensity versus time, we could put that through a spectrum analyzer, you know, or a simple uh, FFT and get its uh, spectrum digitally. Okay. And, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, uh, generally some, some peaks down at, at, I mean, at the high frequencies from uh, thunderstorms and then also at the low frequencies, you know, from, uh, um, uh, from secular variation. I'm sorry, not secular variation from uh, diurnal variations in the uh, uh, in the ionosphere. Okay, so um, uh, you know, just like a uh, uh, just like a magnet can bend, uh, uh, you know, the 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 uh, conductively uh, uh, the conductive cores in a transformer can can. Bend magnetic field lines. Well, so too can the uh, um, uh, can the um, the air, the atmosphere between the ionosphere, which is where currents are, and the Earth, which is where there are more currents. Okay, so we'll have magnetic field lines which are uh, parallel to the surface of the Earth there, and we can measure those to uh, uh, you know to look for variations that are going to be revealing some kind of uh, some kind of deflection. And some kind of structure, okay, conductivity structure. So here's a uh, 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 kind of an outline of of a uh, of a magnetotelluric setup. Okay, we have um, you know maybe uh, uh, two uh, voltage uh, dipoles. You know these are like the uh, the potential side of the um, uh, of the e of the uh, mini res. Except there's uh, there's two of them and they're horizontal, um, you know, and they maybe they're 100 meters long. Okay, fair amount of wire. Uh, we'd like to have a vertical uh, voltage uh, dipole as well, uh, but that would require drilling a 100 meter hole, you know, just for the dipole deployment, and that's not terribly um, uh, not terribly helpful. We will put in a uh, vertical coil. You know, here's. Uh, you know, on a on a map view of the ground, these are the horizontal coils lying around. You know, one in the x direction, one in the y direction, and uh, and then the vertical one. Okay, um, and that's uh, at most uh, uh, usually a meter long, uh, and so that you know we have to we have to you know drill a hole for that or dig a hole for that. Um, for the uh, the electrodes, uh, you know, you could use uh, stakes, but you really want to be uh, Make sure you have a good connection to the ground. So there's this uh, lead and lead chloride filled uh, electrode, and then you saturate that and uh, and the ground with salt water to uh, uh, to get the best uh, that you can. And then there's uh, a remote reference uh, a magnetic uh, observation you have to make. So there's uh, the point you're surveying at. Okay, so you'll move this whole setup. You know the magnetometers. Uh, the uh, uh, the electrical uh, dipoles, uh, you'll move those around, and uh, that's how you'll map uh, the three dimensional uh, resistivity structure of the Earth. And then you got to have some sort of uh, you know reference uh, magnetic field measurements. Okay, 
Uh, so you could you could you know extend a long wire, or you could just set up a magnetic observatory where you uh, you record uh, the magnetic field uh, both uh, horizontally uh, in both directions, uh, reference to time. And then uh, you can work through this uh, impedance equation. Notice that there's uh, uh, you know two components of uh, here uh, the two horizontal components of the electric field measured by the electric dipoles, and here's the two components of the magnetic field, H, um, you know, measured by the uh, magnetic coils. Okay, And then you have um, you know, various components of, of impedance, uh, you know, which is another way of, of saying resistivity. Okay? So you know, impedance is, is like re you know, its resistance uh, before you boil it down to uh, resistivity. So these impedance uh, uh, signals you can you can eventually boil down to resistivity. So you know the uh, the impedance in the x x uh, direction you know relates the uh, magnetic field in the x direction to the <coughs> to the um, uh, the electric field in the x direction. You know, and you have cross directions too, right? Z x y is gonna is gonna uh, you know, look at the interplay between the electric field in the x direction and the magnetic field in the y direction, right? So, uh, uh, you know, you got to keep track of all those directional aspects. This is the kind of uh, of uh, section that um, uh, magnetic uh, or, or magnetotelluric uh, workers uh, like uh, my colleague uh, Phil Wanamaker at Utah. Uh, this is the kind of thing that he can publish. Now, now this is kind of interesting. He's he's giving us here. A, uh, a depth section on a log scale, right? So it starts at zero. That's uh, five kilometers there. You know, so the upper crust, and then by um, you know fifty kilometers, we're we're out of the uh, <clears throat> uh, we are we are out of the uh, uh, out of the crust, at least in the continents, and into the mantle, and then we go as deep as. Uh, 400 kilometers down into the mantle, and so he's uh, modeled all this uh, in in uh, two dimensions for this, uh, uh, you know, MT uh, magnetotelluric deployment. The this is a a line that crosses from um, uh, over the uh, uh, the Cascade subduction zone, right? So this is offshore, right? The skin depth that he's using is is great enough to uh, uh, to penetrate to the sea bottom. Right, and uh, he's seen the Cascades volcanoes. Right, these various colors uh, are uh, resistivity in ohm meters. Right, the red is is uh, very conductive, and as you get to the purple, you're very resistive. Uh, green is kind of intermediate, and he can see the uh, the sort of intermediate uh, uh, to low resistivities of the uh, of the slab interface. Right, the down going slab is down here. Uh, here's the asthenosphere below the slab. Uh, here's the asthenosphere in the in the wedge above the slab. Okay, so um, uh, you know this is the kind of uh, kind of data that magnetotellurics is is looking for. Um, you know we're uh, bouncing waves around and, and and waves upon waves and looking for uh, for disturbances. Okay. And from this uh, this capacitor here, you know, with this disturbance in the electric field, we'll kind of uh, be able to uh, uh, see the, uh, the disturbance there. And uh, here's another example of a disturbance in magnetic field lines that are uh, uh, dependent on a, uh, on a on a insulator, you know, at some depth. Okay, so we uh, we see these waves propagate. Uh, at various frequencies, and they can kind of get caught in the uh, the resistivity structure of, uh, of some areas, and that's all. You know, it's it's that kind of effect that the magnetotelluric data are looking for, and, and that you'll uh, you'll be able to see and try to invert for. Okay, just uh, a couple of illustrations of uh, kind of the skin depth effect, and and uh, you know you can uh, uh, look at the uh, the vibrations. Uh, you know, and, and how they uh, go into the ground and, and that sort of thing. All right, so um, uh, the next topic is going to be uh, radar, uh, which we will go into uh, uh, the week after next. And um, uh, so uh, 
that's uh, all I have for you on uh, uh, these two lectures on uh, electromagnetics, uh, uh, frequency domain, and uh, time domain, uh, with uh, you know the combination of, of resistivity surveying and low frequency um, frequency domain uh, surveying being uh, magnetotellurics.